should be near. Welcome to this first ever international final of Debating Matters. Um, it doesn't matter what happens here, the pupils on this stage are making history because it's never happened before. And the motion we're discussing today is protecting the public from terrorism should come before civil liberties. For the motion, we have SM Chokti School from Pune, the winner of Debating Matters India, and against the motion, the winner of DMC UK 2009, and that is our school from Durham. Can we just welcome them both? Onto the <laughs> OK, let's start. Civil liberties are set limits on the power of the state over an individual and guarantee a private sphere of autonomy where individuals are free to act so long as they do not harm others. We don't deny that civil liberties form the very pillars of democracy, but we believe that in times of crisis, in order to protect these fundamentals, we must protect the public first. The main aim of terrorism is collateral damage and creation of fear amongst the public. Curtailing civil liberties is inconvenient, but the fact is, it does help prevent terrorism. Terrorism is of huge concern to humanity as a whole. When the public is affected by acts of terrorism, their most basic right and fundamental freedom, the right to life, is violated. Recently, Home Secretary Jackie Smith said, people's fundamental civil liberty is that they are kept safe from terrorism and serious crime. The 2006 transatlantic plot is a perfect example. An alleged plot to detonate liquid explosives on 10 airliners traveling from UK to Canada and the US was thwarted by the UK police. What turned out to be UK's largest surveillance operation, calling in 220 additional officers, averted a catastrophic event only because the MI5 secretly checked Ahmed's baggage on his return from Pakistan and in the months to come, secretly broke into his flat. It appeared to be a possible bomb factory. The MI5 left behind a camera and a microphone. And on the 3rd of August, Ahmed Ali and Tanvir Hussain were seen constructing devices out of drink bottles. Considering the frequency and range of terror attacks, civil liberties have to be curtailed in order to ensure the safety of our huge population. Prevention is our only protection. After the Brighton bombings to assassinate Margaret Thatcher, the Irish Republican Army spokesperson accurately summed up the enormity of the issue. We have to be lucky only once. You have to be lucky all the time. Thank you. Prioritisation of protection against terrorism would lead to serious disintegration within the mechanics of our society. People would feel that they had been compromised in order to protect against a possible eventuality. For example, following 9-11, George Bush passed the USA Patriot Act. This allowed the authorities to tap phones, monitor email communication and even search personal, medical and financial records. Bush viewed this as a necessary measure in response to the terrorist attacks, but opposition escalated as the public felt that they were treated like terrorists due to the extreme levels of investigation. Civil liberties are a central factor to the functionality of every society. To allow this to be undone by terrorist movements seems illogical as it gives in to their behaviour. Above all else, we should preserve civil liberties, or we will experience a situation far worse than any terrorist attack, as we will live in a society based upon suspicion. Civil liberties should be one thing that the terrorists cannot damage. I thank you for your time and encourage your freedom of speech to vote for the opposition. It is said that fighting terrorism is like being a goalkeeper. You can make a thousand good saves, but the one that gets past you is the one people remember and the one you can never forgive yourself for letting go. When the government makes an effort to thwart terror attacks, we complain about our liberties being encroached upon. And when an attack does take place, we criticize the government for its inability to do anything to protect its citizens. It's about time we stopped straddling over the issue and took a stand, because it's just not possible to have the best of both worlds. Let's apply simple reasoning. If I were to issue a notice to a, to a suspected terrorist informing him that his phone lines were going to be tapped for a couple of months. He would have to be out of his mind to even lift that phone. The nature of terrorism is such that it, it demands flexible countermeasures. The law has always had to make use of wiretaps 
computer hacks, surveillance, undercover officers, sting operations, raids. It is the unpredictability and stealth of these methods that have helped thwart a number of terrorist plots. The most recent one being the white supremacist terror plot. The monitoring of internet usage of two suspects by the UK police led to a major bust of what appeared to be an attack, an attempt of bio-warfare. This example helps prove my point that allowing governments to infringe on a few liberties does help thwart catastrophic attacks. We are constantly worried about the fact that the government may abuse the power, but given the limited task force employed in security agencies, the alarming rise in new terror outfits does not leave the government with much time, resource, or manpower to waste on a person who isn't a suspected terrorist. The restriction on basic civil liberties should be defined precisely and be necessary and proportionate to the aim pursued. We can and must ensure that basic human rights aren't violated by prohibiting random arrests without suspicion and supporting impartial committees and bodies to oversee de detention proceedings pre-trial. Having a specified time period for which a suspect can be detained also helps solve the issue of human rights. Tony Blair rightly said, it isn't a fight between individual countries and terrorism, but between the free and democratic and terrorism. Of the two, only one can exist. If terrorism does, then it erases civil liberties, the very pillars of democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, my partner Laura has already explained to you the, the uh, detrimental effects that removing civil liberties could have on society and that the loss of freedom may actually lead to increased terrorism. I'm going to focus on the overhyping of the terrorist threat, the discrimination that comes from the removal of civil liberties, and the probable ineffectiveness of removing these civil liberties in the first place. Ladies and gentlemen, during the course of our lives, we are far more likely to be involved in a car accident than we are to be blown up by a terrorist. Yet few people are suggesting that we should ban cars. This is because the advantages of cars, getting from A to B very quickly, far outweigh the potential for a fatal accident. This is the same with terrorism and civil liberties. The disadvantages of introducing draconian measures such as having freedom of speech taken away, a 42-day detention, and of having our phones and emails checked and our data stored far outweigh the potential advantages of being saved from a terrorist attack. This is overhyped. Not only are these me measures oppressive, but also losses of data such as the MOD losing information on 1.7 million people mean that our private details could fall into the wrong hands. This kind of overhyping only leads to paranoia, which then leads to the public becoming more concerned about terrorism than they need to be. The war on terror unfairly discriminates towards a Muslim community, who of course are mostly against terrorism. This invites fear and suspicion, meaning that the old cliché, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, is proved incorrect, as those who have done nothing wrong are suspected. Since Stop and Search was introduced in 2000, two-thirds of those arrested have been Muslim, despite the fact that the majority of those convicted under anti-terror laws are non-Muslim. This kind of racial profiling leads to mistrust, fear and suspicion of a community who have been criminalised in the name of security. Since September 2001, 1,471 people have been arrested under the Terrorism Act, but 56% of these people have been released without charge and only 102 have been convicted of terror offences. This suggests that the government's promise of having detailed and compelling evidence before arresting somebody is obviously not as detailed and compelling as they've said. This leads to the wrongful arrest, imprisonment, and later social blacklisting of innocent people. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that removal of civil liberties would have a detrimental effect on society, would lead to discrimination, that removal of civil liberties would not actually help our fight against terror. And it's for these reasons that we urge you to oppose this motion. Thank you. Because it's a goalkeeper analogy that you use, we always have to have constant vigilance. Uh, so this is like an eternal process of vigilance, a complete police society that's never going to go away because, as far as you're concerned, the threat's never going to go away. So are you kind of really creating a police state in perpetuity? In the Mumbai examples, though, how many of those people came from India? And by watching the activities of Indians, um, what would have changed there? They came from somewhere else. They came by water. They didn't have email accounts on Indian soil. So I just wonder which is one of the most...
psyche-destroying attacks. And if you go back to another psyche-destroying attack, not far from you, the Mumbai attacks, orchestrated by a man sitting in Dubai, who's still free, still at large, not many people arrested there. How would snooping on men, your goalkeeper analogy, you could stick a man in a goal for perpetuity and none of that would have changed, would it? When you look at this and you sort of apply the argument of moral calculus, I'd just be interested to hear your attitude to that. You know, where does the moral calculus start and stop when you look at individuals versus the greater good for the greater number? We aren't exactly creating a police state by enforcing all these kind of surveillance activities. What we're trying to look at is the greater good. Are we, do we want to protect the people? Do we want a thousand lives being, uh, I mean, thousands of people dead? Or do we actually want to look at a cer certain liberties being curtailed? We have to look at the lesser of the two evils. Would you rather have a person dead and then he doesn't have any rights? Or would you rather have a certain, certain amount of rights curtailed? Uh, Mahatma Gandhi was called a terrorist by the British state uh, and was clamped down upon, uh, as was uh, Nelson Mandela. And I think that uh, all I'm saying is you could use the example of Iran at the moment, right, where you have protesters which, in public opinion to a large extent in the West, are seen as being freedom fighters or people who are in favor of liberty and against a rigged election, a similar example, uh, and a state which is basically saying that these are a problem and a destabilizing element. Yeah, but I think the classification of a terrorist, terrorist basically, is anyone who incites violence, anyone who's out to kill thousands of people. I mean, in today's in today's modern world, no one, no one's, uh, no one. I don't think any of your, any of us here would deem Mahatma Gandhi as a terrorist. Can I just come back yeah. on this point, where if you impose draconian measures to try and prevent? Do we actually know that that is the best way to go about it? But we aren't imposing draconian measures. We, all we're saying is we should, these mistakes have happened in the past. We should have impartial committees, bodies, safeguards that will actually help protect the, uh, I mean, help see human rights and uh, civil liberties so that these people who are su suspected terrorists, their rights aren't, their basic rights aren't violated. Like NGOs, human rights organi organizations being there in a trial proceeding, a pre-trial proceeding before deeming him a terrorist. That's what we're trying to say, that certain liberties should be curtailed. Well, what would happen if there was a ticking time bomb thesis and you knew there was somebody standing there who had a lot of information? Would you advocate that you torture that person because you think another bomb's about to go off in half an hour? Uh, I think, again, we have to check. Would you rather have one person tortured or would you rather have 300 people dead? Very quick point. Um, it was very interesting. You said that terrorism, the definition, was somebody who would kill 1,000 to 2,000 people or incite racial hatred, your term. Um, if you start profiling a type of person as terrorist, are you not inciting racial hatred? It happened in India post Operation Blue Star where many innocent Sikhs were, were beaten and killed. So are you not actually on a very slippery slope yourselves by doing that? Just a fact, the Khalistan movement was started by Dr. Jagjit Singh Chauhan and he actually misused his civil liberties. He um, wanted a separate state of Punjab, okay, and what he wanted to do was create an independent state. He actually issued passports, currency and printed stamps for Khalistan, a state that did not even exist. In that way, he misused his civil liberties and because of this, um, the Air India Flight 182 which was bombed, which killed one, uh, 329 people. That was bad. Laura, you said that people really care about their civil liberties. They care about freedom of speech. They care about these freedoms that you talk about. In any opinion poll that's been conduct conducted about whether people would be happy to lose some of their freedoms to feel safer when it comes to terrorism, they vote resoundingly for a curtailment of their civil liberties and for more police powers. So are you sure you're in step with what people really want? When would you cross the divide and say that civil liberties need to be impinged upon to prevent some disaster? Well, Laura said um, civil liberties are uh, central to the functionality of the state. And I might argue that actually surveillance is it's an unfortunate fact of life, but surveillance is central to the functionality of the state. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether you've been slightly naive. Um, we would actually argue that um, people may not fully understand the extent to which their civil liberties are going to be infringed upon. Um, within my speech, I used the example of the US Patriot Act, and originally people were fine about 
the idea of having liberties infringed upon due to the extremities of the situation with 9-11. However, once they realised the levels of surveillance which were going to occur, and kind of, as I said, searching of email, and it wasn't just this, it was also personal records, um, this was something which, which did strike opposition. And also, I was going to say, to Austin's point, you did mention the Terrorist Act, but in actual fact, um, there are very few convictions under the Terrorist Act. I would argue the point that you made about civil liberties being central to um, society. I would argue that the surveillance that, that you mentioned is unnecessary because um, currently the only reason why the paranoia is not um, out of control is because civil liberties occur and that people know that they have a distinct level of freedom. Um, whereas if civil liberties were infringed upon and um, began to um, disintegrate, then as Ali spoke about the overhype, it would become a state which was purely involved within paranoia and suspicion. Okay. Um, to respond as well to David's point, who um, you asked when we would begin to infringe upon civil liberties, and we say that there would never be a threat that would be great enough to mean that civil liberties for our entire um, globe or country could be infringed upon and that we believe that a free society should be worth some risk. And obviously we are not condoning abandoning the war on terror entirely, but we need to find a way to work with civil liberties and without taking away people's intrinsic freedoms to try and fight the war on terror. But if you're sitting in a city and the city's been attacked and then there's another attack and there's another attack and it's coming from all angles and you've got the job of trying to keep the population calm and yet you continue to argue about civil liberties, isn't there a break point at some point where you can't just stay with this idealistic stand. We would argue that um, if extreme levels of surveillance are introduced and the people feel like they are treated as, t uh, they are suspected and treated like terrorists themselves with all of the conspiracy theories, that the panic would actually be extended and that the public may feel even less safe within their own society as they would feel that they are being turned upon. I think, Laura, it was the point that you made that if you curtail civil liberties, then you may cause the emergence of domestic terror. Well, the thing is, we're, we're only talking about relooking at our laws because domestic terror is what brought it onto the agenda. So the laws were, were not as they are now, and yet we have domestic terror. Um, aren't you actually dealing with a world long, long ago, far, far away? <laughs> not reality. I would argue to that that the majority of terrorist movements actually stemmed out of repression of civil liberties and that if we allow this to occur within our society, because we're used to um, having freedom and extensive civil liberties, that possibly, the, the possibility could arise for um, domestic movement. How do we create something worse than terrorism when we are protecting thousands of lives by infringing on a few liberties? Are you justifying acts of murder? Could you give me one example where the public has been protected from terrorism without infringing on even one civil liberty? And um, the question about overhyping terrorism, do you think 9-11 was being overhyped? Um, I would argue that it's impossible to ig ignore terrorism or even deny its existence, as this would be completely unfair to those that have lost their lives. However, I don't see why we should then reduce the human right of our own people. As I said, this is a fundamental to society. Um, and I feel that this would simply give the terrorists far more ground, um, which could be exploited in the future. Well, with regards to the overhyping, I mean, 9-11 obviously was a terrible thing, but it does not happen every day. And that's what we are trying to say when we say that terrorist threat is overhyped. And obviously, we should take steps to try and prevent terrorist attacks, but not to the detriment of our society and taking away of our civil liberties to something which has been overhyped. You're saying that uh, these terrorist attacks don't take place every day. May I remind you, after the 9-11, we had the Madrid bombings, then we had the 772 bombings, then we had 2611. We're talking about the magnitude of these attacks. Yes, they don't, do not happen every day. We're talking about the magnitude and scale. Even 2006, if the transatlantic plot had taken place, 3,000 people would have been dead. And that plot was thwarted only because of surveillance. So how do you justify that these terrorists should be nailed without, without certain infringements? How do you, how do you protect such, such huge mass of public without uh, curtailing a few liberties? Well, I suggest that a free society should be worth some risk. And so we should be prepared to take 
that what I still say is a relatively minor risk of being attacked by a terrorist, we should be prepared to accept that risk for a free society and for a democratic society. So you've accepted that terrorism is a major problem in, uh, now and it has taken the lives of you know, thousands of people and we need to protect the people from this. And, and you couldn't give me an example of how it was done without infringing on a civil liberty. So obviously we have to infringe upon a civil liberty to do this. Well, I was wondering um, exactly how far you're prepared to take this infringement of civil liberty, so are you, are you prepared to use torture? Um, are you prepared to use sort of control orders and house arrests and that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, and I was going to ask how you think that the um, public would react to being treated with suspicion and having their freedom curbed. The reason we want the curtailment of civil liberties is so that we can protect the public. And you asked how far we're prepared to take this. Um, we're going to go we're going to, that's exactly why we want to, you know, tackle the problem before it actually comes before us. We're trying to, we know that there is a problem and we're going to solve it before it's in our face. We don't want to give a knee-jerk reaction to it. Um, the Indian team presented the choice between um, would you rather have a person dead or a person without some few rights. And I don't think that's the choice here because if the rights that you're curtailing are so few and so little, do, will they really have an effect? If somebody really wants to take a bomb onto a plane, they'll find a way. Um, you said uh, that uh, about the whole thing that terrorism is overhyping, and it is a minor risk. So, um, and you also compared terrorism to car accidents. I think car accidents and terrorism are two completely two different spheres. Road accidents caused by negligence and proper planned attacks on Innocent citizens are two very different th uh, attacks that need to be dealt accordingly. So when you say it's a minor risk, how many more terrorist attacks must occur on how much more daily basis, how many more lives do you propose must be lost if we finally realize that the problem is out of hand and then don't you think it will be a bit too late? Now if I'm planning to bomb London, I mean, I'm not going to do it, but... <laughs> if I'm planning to bomb London... We are bombing this. <laughs> I'm not going to be sitting in center of Trafalgar Square with a table in front of me with all kinds of explosives, right? Like, I'm certainly, certainly going to be in some quiet, inconspicuous place where I can calmly do my job and keep the bomb and run away. So, how do you think it is possible for the anti-terror anti police to, I mean, to handle such cases without the use of random raids or secret cameras in public places? and, uh, I mean, and in, in interrogation without uh, any warrant. Yeah, originally you said that you would um, torture someone to get the information, and then you went back on that. But um, yet, do you not think that um, in, in a situation of torture, innocent people would just lie to stop the pain, and terrorists would be trained to deal with torture, so you just wouldn't get anywhere? And this is not typical of what happens when we inhibit civil liberties. The innocent are oppressed and inconvenienced, and terrorists are further infuriated by this inhibition but find ways around the phone tapping, surveillance and torture to still achieve their needs. Um, you said that you would um, in stop people from inciting uh, racial hatred. Well, surely um, domestic terrorists, like the people who committed the 7th and attacks, were incentivized to attack because they thought that they were being repressed by the state. Now, surely, if they feel that like they're being repressed by the state and that their religious rights are being um, repressed, it makes the job of people like Abu Hamza much easier because the state is actually actively oppressing people. And surely that means that we are not um, preventing terrorism, that we're actually making it more likely by um, our actions. In answer to John's question, we are learning from history, from what happened 10 years ago. And that is exactly why we're trying to put in place certain safeguards, so that we don't have to make a quick and irrational decision when we're faced with the problem. Um, I was going to say about kind of like the police investigation that was raised and how actually should we deal with people, you know, without investigation at a level of... Um, curtailing of civil liberties and what I would actually say is that we would stress the importance of a fair investigation with evidence. We're not saying that terrorists shouldn't be dealt with, we're not saying that they should be within society and we know that they're there and we'll just let them blow things up. What we're actually saying is that we need to treat people fairly, we need to treat them like human beings because everyone has basic rights which we should be allowed to protect. And I think that if we have fair police investigations with a distinct level of evidence, this would not prevent freedom. And also we need to consider the fact that if we don't have this level of evidence, that people who are accused would perhaps still be suspected within society um, by, by other people. And I think that we need to tread particularly carefully in the way in which we, we treat potential suspects. Simply put, 
perhaps the hundreds of deaths in Mumbai are more down to the disputes over Kashmir than to, some, than to, than to a real terrorist threat. I'm willing to accept that in the future there may be a real threat that poses a massive threat to life. In this circumstance, I would accept the loss of life. This is because I believe in human beings. And I believe that human beings possess above all reason, rationalism and agency. Any limit on civil liberty is nothing less than a limit on such values. Therefore, limits on liberty are nothing less than an attack on what it means to be human. Our civil liberties are already being cut short. Um, just look at the Iraq war, how we were misinformed, saying there's nuclear weapons and terrorists. Um, look at the case where the guy got shot to death um, in the tube. Just look at um, all the arrests every time um, of IRA membership before PTA renewals. The fact is that we are living in a society where um, civil liberties are being curtailed, and this is wrong. How would we fight the war on terror without infringing upon civil liberties, where well, we would argue that by simply allowing free speech and allowing the process for debate, that we can manage to convince by our arguments that terrorists are wrong, and also by um, better communication between communities, international communities, and communities within uh, localised countries would help with the terrorist threat. Um, furthermore, somebody made the point about um, how our civil liberties are already being cut short and that this is wrong, and yet, yes, we do agree. And we think that, in fact, some of the measures that are in place at the moment are excessive, such as the 28-day detention. Okay, thanks. Um, just to add to that last point that, that Ali made, perhaps it is a case that civil liberties currently are infringed upon, but I don't see why we should extend this gap and leave our society completely exposed to a terrorist attack. In answer to the question about um, how we are misusing civil liberties, um, Dr. Jagjit Singh Johan was inciting violence. He created a fake state, one that did not exist. This led to the, bo um, the bombing of the Air India flight, which claimed 329 lives. It also led to the assassination of our Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and Operation Blue Star, which claimed another life. An eye for an eye will get the whole world blind. That's what you said, right? But I think a lot of people in this room would sleep safer knowing that there's a blind terrorist around rather than one who has a Secondly, you, the other fellow from Queens also said that humans have rational thinking. The only thing when I see 9-11's clip again and again is like, what are those guys thinking? Is that, is that, there's no rational explanation for that. And the question about curtail, um, curtailing civil liberties increases the threat of terrorism. Isn't it a vicious cycle in which, you know, when we curtail civil liberties, it's oppression and then people are taking to terrorism. Because of terrorism, we're curtailing civil liberties. We need to stop this somewhere, right? So before we're faced with a problem, why can't we put in certain safeguards by in ensuring that, you know, the public is protected? Haven't we already lost the war on terror? Because we've surrendered to terror by... Uh, destroying our own ideals, torturing people, and killing people. Haven't we already lost the war on terror? I just want to say a small observation for all of y'all. Y'all have realized this problem only because of 9-11, 7-7, or whatever it is. In India, we have been facing this because of Kashmir for ages and ages, where y'all were really not aware of what is actually happening to the Kashmiri pundits. I would just like you to take a view of this. That's all. You don't have any idea what it's like to live in a country where you don't have the luxury of giving in to a few restrictions and having your, and curtailing your civil liberties in order to feel safe. Bombs and terror attacks are indiscriminate and commonplace in India. We all know people who have lost loved ones to terrorists. And I think because you live in relative safety, because you have relinquished some of your civil liberties, you are being naive and insulting to those who live in fear every day and ungrateful. We need to accept that terrorism exists. It has taken the lives of thousands of innocent people. We need to protect these people from terrorism. And protecting them comes before civil liberties. Once we accept this, let us just get down to doing this in a planned and informed manner rather than taking a knee-jerk reaction. Thank you. Protection against terrorism is important, but I don't see any rational reason why um, the, this should be at the expense of civil liberties and how this will enhance the war on terror. I believe that retaining freedom of speech can be used as an intellectual device to dispel internal terrorism within our communities. We should not allow civil liberties to be eroded. We should remain strong, remain united and remain free. Thank you.
I think it's really easy to talk when we're sitting in these red couches. The problem begins and ends with us. Democracy has always stressed on equality. We have misused our right to live in a multicultural nation by isolating certain communities, and it is the misuse of our civil liberties that has created terrorists. We blame the government, when in reality, it is we who have sowed the seeds of terror. We can only protect the public, public's right, if the public is alive and walking. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, terrorists want to disrupt our society. By allowing them to do so, we are letting the terrorists win the war on terror. Uh, uh, to deal with the point about our security being threatened, um, we would argue that our security is threatened by being constantly monitored, by having our data logged, and by having our data potentially lost by government departments who leave briefcases on trains, it seems, every day. Ladies and gentlemen, democratic values, freedom and morality, these are things that terrorists want to erode in our society, and these are things which must, above all else, be preserved. Well, I must say I was hugely impressed with what you did. And I was looking at a few criteria that we were asked to sort of judge you on. And there's no doubt you did excellent research. Um, you were very coherent. You thought about the issues and you articulated them very clearly. Um, you thought about it in a social context and in a global context. There was quite a lot of emphasis on the history of what had happened in India, which I'm sure a number of the people in the audience weren't so familiar with, but you got into that very cleverly and very effectively. And a lot of people said you've had a lot of time to prepare for this, but you've also had to argue the difficult line in a room like this with young people who are idealistic. And you argued it well. And what I liked about you is that a couple of times you really sort of threw quite killer questions the other way. What I wasn't so keen on, or maybe it's a good mark, it's definitely a good mark of a politician, but I, it irritates the hell out of me is when you don't answer a question and you answer what you want to answer. So, I mean, there, there were things that were thrown by me and others where people wanted to know just how much were you willing to give up. And the phrase that kept coming up was certain liberties. Yes, we're going to give up certain liberties. I still don't know what on earth you're talking about. Which ones? I still want to know. And I think that maybe is a cleverness on your part to not answer, it's a very difficult question, but it also, I found it pretty frustrating. You were coherent and I was great to work through, so what well done. You'd also done a lot of thinking, and given the fact that you've been through four debates in the last three days, to have to come back again, I mean, you've run a marathon and you've managed to keep your pace up, which is, which is hugely impressive. I'm not sure that you were quite as sharp as the others in terms of engaging on the issues as they were being thrown at you. I think your colleagues had more time to think and probably rehearse some, some answers to potential questions. You've had to work harder in a way because you've had less time to do it. They were maybe a little bit sharper in the response. I was really also very surprised that you didn't bring up John Charles de Menezes, which is an absolute trump card in your argument. It came up through a question and you kind of yeah, wore it, but it wasn't your clothes, you know, they, they weren't things you produced in your suitcase. You're very charming, both of you, you work really beautifully together, I mean, I saw you making notes and showing each other which way you were going to go, but again, this is a sympathetic audience to what you believe, or what you had to believe today, and I just thought you could have pushed some of those points, which were really good ones, better. If you had good stuff, learn to pick it and throw it out more. Generally, I thought you did a really, really nice job, very well structured, and actually a lot better than you seem to think. Well done to both teams here. Yeah. I've drawn the short straw to uh, announce this. The winner uh, of the 2009 International, first international, is... <laughs> <laughs> is Chalksy.